this might be a good time to introduce our guest, uh, Jeff Newberry, who is a very long time youth soccer coach and the former director of coaching at uh, DDY Soccer. And if I had to guess, it's probably drinking a coffee. <laughs> that is correct. I am rocking the Folgers 2020, um, gearing up for my my team's 10 o'clock fantasy draft for some reason. So <laughs> <laughs> that's fantasy football for everyone out there. But thank you guys for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for joining, Jeff. And Jeff and I um, have known each other probably, I don't know, maybe since middle school, Jeff, but, you know, certainly, yeah. um, you know, through grade school and high school, played soccer together in high school. And uh, cross paths years later in the ADASL and um, you know, we we're just talking about some tournaments like in Charleston that we played in so uh, great to have a fellow Hornet on the uh, on the show. Yeah you gotta let the big bee sting. That's right man. So Jeff uh, just to, to learn a little bit more about about you and and soccer uh, can you talk to the guests about your history with soccer why you love the sport how you got into it from a young age and um, you know, how it's influenced your life, and, and particularly when Atlanta United got a team you know, three years ago, how did you become a fan of Atlanta United, and what does it mean that we've got an MLS club? Yeah, I mean, um, as far as my history with the game, I'm pretty much like a lot of other people, grow up in the youth system um, here in Georgia. Um, like you said, I went to Roswell High School, you know, spent a little bit of time overseas later on in life, and then... Um, have been coaching now. I'm going to date myself. It's probably going to date everybody on this call for I'm entering my 29th year of youth coaching. And um, that's awesome, man. Yeah, I started actually coaching at 14 years old. My club coach at the time actually kind of asked me if I'd work with him on his other team as a trainer. So uh, I, I actually think at that was that moment I started to realize that uh, I was probably a better coach than a player. So of course, stubbornly, I didn't find that out till much longer in life. But um, you don't don't kid yourself. You're a good player too, man. Yeah, I sat behind you for a year, if you remember. <laughs> so, um, for your audience, just so you know, uh, Mike actually is a year older than me, but uh, actually took, you know, took a lot of care for me when I was young and tried to get me to do the right things. So, I wasn't too much of an ass. I don't, you know, no, as a, a fifteen-year-old. <laughs> Yeah, I had, I was very fortunate to have a lot of people when I was young, uh, you know, like Mike, and there's another guy named Chad, we both know that really looked after me, made me do the right isn't it, thing. Isn't it incredible, though, like some of the yeah. soccer talent that, that we grew up with, like, I mean, I feel like I was on the very low end of the spectrum. And, you know, particularly if we had had some, uh, some, some better coaching at different levels, I think there was, I certainly had some good coaches at different uh, points. Uh, Guerrero was a great coach, um, you know, growing up, but it was few and far between that I think, uh, and we'll talk a bit, little bit more yeah. about that in the podcast, but keep, keep going. Yeah, no, um, just really started to really realize that I actually, um, after my playing days kind of fell out of, fell out of love with the game, to be honest with you. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I still to the day don't really watch. I watch a leaning and I don't know, I'll touch on that in a second, but I don't watch a lot of soccer. Um, I realized how much I actually love coaching and loved, you know, watching the young players develop and sort of committed myself to, to sort of follow in that line um, because I think that's where, you know, we start. And obviously you mentioned, we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail, but uh, I think from a simple thing, why I love the game is, is it, you can't cheat it. <laughs> I mean, there's yeah. no, there's, there's no running and hiding out there. Um, you know, and when I found out Atlanta United got a team, I was obviously like everyone else, man, I was stoked, you know, not just for the city, but um, especially for the city mainly because, this is a we we tend to we tend to forget this is a hotbed of youth soccer georgia's top five state yeah we produce an enormous amount of talent here this is a a very diverse city and it's a city capable of really really being supportive of it, which you've seen yeah. you know we've seen what atlanta united has done and um and i think they're as an organization uh, i think we may be frustrated with wins and losses and decisions with players, but let's be very candid. This is a world-class organization, unlike any other in the MLS um, by a landslide, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's tough sometimes because they make decisions that are cold, you know, but that's, that's what they do. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I can't agree more in terms of, uh, you know, the, the influence that having a team has on the youth is, is really important. And, I, you know, the first game I went to at Bobby Dodd, I think just going into the stadium and seeing all the young kids that really kind of clicked with me, just seeing people with their family and their young kids 
how much it actually meant to have a, a pro soccer team there. Yeah, and I think uh, I hope you know, hope your audience and you guys know how much Atlanta United actually before they launched, like before they officially, you know, before Bobby Dodd, before the Benz, before Miguel, they were in the community really kind of engaging all of the youth soccer leaders, um, and they were trying to really. It was a very very needed perspective, um, and they came in and they there was a sense that at the youth level they would be competition, but they really squashed that and. Um, you know, now they, there's elaborate partnerships with clubs where there's the, they are really getting the feeders. You know, the youth clubs are now feeding them, and it, there's a badge of honor associated with it. And I think that's fantastic. That's the way you come in. They came in first class, and um, and I think that's a testament to Carlos and Darren Hills and, and a lot of the So what was your, your interaction being, you know, a prominent member of the uh, Atlanta youth soccer scene? What was your interaction with the club during those early days before the, the professional product was on the field? Like, did they reach out to you? Did you have conversations? Uh, they did. Um, you know, at the time, if you remember, Dave, I was on my, my first retirement um, <laughs> and trying to walk away from this for a long time. But uh um, keeps pulling me back in. And so they re-engaged me at the club level. They spoke with the, my replacement. Um, and then they re-engaged me and I actually had the chance to sit down with Carlos two or three times um, and just talked about youth soccer in, in Georgia, talked about the players I've seen, talked about some of the players I coached and what we were thinking, what they were thinking, what we were thinking as a club um, and really what they could do, that, that was the, Carlos is one of the truly genuine great people. I mean, just my interactions with him have been fantastic. He's a, he's a professional across the board in everything he does. And um, the way he really kind of, uh, he talked about players was that holistic approach that, well, if it's right for us, it's right for them, it's right. But if it's not right for them, even if it's right for us, we're still going to make that decision for them, which I thought was a very positive approach. Um, so, you know, obviously we spent a lot of time talking about it, one player in particular, um, one of their initial homegrown signings. And um, Did you have any advice for them, you know, just in general? I mean, not with regard to the single player, but overall? Yeah, I mean, my, my advice to them was that, you know, listen, it, it, youth soccer anywhere you go, and Georgia's no different, is it's a snake pit, you know? We're all competing yes. with each other. You know, right. the behind the scenes, we're all very friendly with each other. There's a great deal of respect amongst all the club leaders and coaches, but they're never going to say that to a person. Right? <laughs> you know, it's all behind the scenes, you know? Yeah. Um, and I told him that. I said, don't, don't, don't get involved in that. I said, be independent, be a little bit different. And, and they brought in Tony Annan, and Tony's a, a tremendous coach, tremendous uh, leader. Right. And Tony understood that as well. So at the youth level, it was just staying out of the, the politics of it. Right. Not taking a side. And, and they've done a fantastic job with it. So for our listeners, is, is, is Tony Annan, if I'm not mistaken, he's the ATL United 2 coach now that Stephen Glass is the interim coach of the, the main team. Right. Yeah, that's correct. He, he's I don't I think he still runs the academy side for the youth. Um, I think he's probably doing double duty, but yeah, he's, right. he, and he's the right guy to step into that role. Um, obviously he knows the players, he knows, you know, they work closely, the Academy and I think a two are working very closely together. So uh, he's a, yeah. And it's a, you know, the Academy program sort of, uh, you, and you, well, you see it, right. You see the, the young players are getting a lot of opportunities there. So I think that's what a two is for, you know, its purpose is. So how does the Academy pro, how do the Academy programs work that funnel into Atlanta United twos and, and the program? So it's a little bit, it's, it's kind of an interesting question because COVID kind of blew up a lot. Uh, youth soccer, uh, not just in Georgia, but especially in Georgia, because we were, it was coming here. It's been, um, it, it's been, uh, when we were growing up, there was, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 clubs that's ballooned to, in some cases, 300, right? Yeah. Um, we're all on top of each other. So it sort of ballooned up and then you had this tier structure that was ever changing, which is still is changing. Um, and, uh, each of the MLS is uh, the MLS, you know, professional sides had a, a, an academy team, you know, so when we refer to academy, when we talk about the MLS, we're talking about developmental academy. And that is, um, that is governed by the U S soccer federation. And there's probably, there was, excuse me, around a hundred such clubs are across the nation and they sort of play each other. And that was the high pyramid on the boy side that's since gone away. Um, 
part of that was COVID. Part of that was, you know, there depends on who you ask. Part of it was U.S. soccer prepping for a lawsuit they were involved in. That's one theory. The reality is I think it was more of a cost thing. It just wasn't cost effective. So each MLS academy is now sort of out there on their own. And, you know, every state's going to be different. So California, they probably play each other. Atlanta United being the the MLS program in the Southeast, um, you know, I think it's still figuring out how, how their academy teams, you know, U12 all the way up to U19 are going to be participating and what leagues are going to participate in. Some of them are in ECNL, which is a, um, a, a nationwide league. Some of them, are, they form their own league. So there's, there's a lot in flux right now. COVID certainly kicked that into high gear. Um, so how it works um, with them independently is still in the air. But um, what's going on is a lot of the, the youth clubs in this area, um, are all sort of participating in, in feeding them players and they'll come out and recruit and um, you know they'll, they'll they'll ask the coaches flat out do you have anybody that we should take a look at and if you say yes they you can send that play over on a, on a Monday night you know there's no holding back there's no rules that prevent it um, and you know as a coach you know that is your goal as a youth coach is to is to get those players to Atlanta United um, you know, so, uh, so are they was, reaching out to just the top clubs? Are they reaching out to all 300 clubs? Like, how, how does it work? Yeah, I mean, it's it's difficult. And, um, you know, I think the answer to that is, is they're probably um, taking a lot. They probably have people out there that are really, you know, I'm, it, listen, you call a big club that, you know, they, they talk regularly, right? You know, we have about five or six, what I would say, really large clubs in Georgia. And uh, they're talking, you know, the Atlanta United folks are talking to, those clubs on a regular basis. Now, little or clubs, some of the clubs in Savannah, you know, there's, there's some reaching out that's probably going on on their behalf. Um, so, you know, I think um, that's a, it's a challenge for Atlanta United um, to cover the geography of the state of Georgia, right? That's not, that's not an easy thing. I mean, obviously it's a small example of a larger issue, but um, as, but you're talk, have, yeah. as you're talking about those, it is interesting though, that you know, when you and I were growing up, right, like the holy grail is to play college soccer, basically, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. now there's a different path. So how do you, you know, now that you're coaching, what do you see from kids in terms of like what they're talking about in terms of college soccer and the path to, you know, play for one of these USL teams or, um, you know, ultimately, you know, MLS or beyond? Yeah, and I think it's funny because that conversation has shifted within the last two years. Um the existence of Atlanta too, which is, I think is a, a very, very monumental movement for Atlanta. Um, there's not just the city, but the Atlanta United as an organization in U.S. soccer, obviously. But let's say, you know, three years ago, um, four years ago, I guess we can go a little bit further. Playing for, jumping from a, a, a youth academy team to um, an MLS program, it existed and it was there. I actually was involved in a lot of those discussions with a player I coached and that required that player to move, whether it was to Arizona uh, or to Philadelphia or to Dallas. Um, that conversation has changed now. Those players here don't have to leave. That's one. Um, the second part is, is that now with Atlanta two, the USL is a viable option. So a kid can choose, you know, if you're coming up through Atlanta United or you're coming up through a private club, you know, you can go and try out for the USL side. Um, you can go to college. And in some, depending on the player, that, that decision could be different. You know, you know, if you're offered a contract with A2 or even a homegrown, you know, some of the, comp, some of the questions you need to ask yourself is how quickly are you going to get on the field with either, right? And is college the right path? Um, because, you know, you can get to, you know, Julian Gressel and Miguel Almiron had two different ways to the MLS, but they both arrived at the same time. You know, one went four years of college and the other went, uh, you know, Miguel's way. So, you know, I think it opens up the opportunities. Um, and for Atlanta United specifically as an MLS side, um, it's a huge advantage. It's an advantage they did not have when they signed those initial homegrowns. You know, they didn't have the opportunity to see those players um, in a professional environment against professional players over an extended period of time. And I think they would be honest and tell you that. Um, I think when I look at it, uh, you know, no one, I think there's a lot of conversations about the success or failure of the homegrowns. Um, I think context is key, you know. Can you explain to the, the listeners who might not know what exactly a homegrown is? Yeah, so 
I'm not an expert in this area, um, but I can. The gist of it is, is that a homegrown player is one where the MLS there's some salary considerations and there's some there's some rights that they retain by signing a player. Um, okay. I think it's a positive for the club, meaning there's a, a financial benefit to signing a homegrown. I, if I, I wouldn't quote me on this, but I believe they're exempted from certain salary cap restrictions in the interim. Um, when a player comes through their academy program for an extended period of time, and I don't have the exact number, um, and they go off to college, Atlanta United still has some rights to that player if they enter the MLS draft or they want to sign oh. with an MLS team. Yeah. I say that because there's a player at Wake Forest right now who put on your radar. His name was going to be talked about pretty soon here, yeah, especially in Atlanta. He is, uh, um, he is somebody that uh, will be coming this way very shortly. <laughs> I have a feeling. What, you, what's his name? Yeah, what's his name? Uh, uh, Machop Chol. He played for the. He plays for Wake Forest now. Um, he's in. Uh, he's a standout there. Uh, fantastic player. Big, six foot three. Uh, central player, lengthy, talented. Um, was also. He was on the same DA team, but he just chose the path of going to college, and it's been a great transition for him. A very intelligent kid. Um, so he's. Uh, you know, I think he's in his senior year now. So we'll probably be hearing now. Atlanta United has some rights to him. I don't. I don't know the exact particulars, but. He's a guy I, you know, I, I always say you, you'd be surprised. He'll probably step on that field pretty soon. He's a good, he's a fantastic player. So tell us a little bit about the experience with Lagos for the, for the listeners. So Lagos Kungo came through the DDY system from a very young age. And Jeff was his coach, I think all the way through. And he's now one of the homegrown players for Atlanta United, although he's currently on loan with uh, Phoenix in the USL. Yeah, so um, obviously, yeah, Lagos, he played 10 years at DDY. Um, we were in a strange situation with him because um, I won't go into his uh, probably by far and away the most misunderstood player I've ever heard. I mean, pretty much everything I hear about him is usually wrong, exaggerated, or incorrect. Um, he is a, a very, very unique player. And he um, so he came up through the DDY system, and then right before – he was going to head off to a developmental academy. It was announced that Atlanta United was forming, was, you know, was, was coming here um, and that they were going to have an, a youth academy. So we sort of put the brakes on everything and we said, okay, um, there's no point in going from one and then moving the next season. Let's just wait it out. And he joined the first um, U19, U18, U19, whatever the age group they used, um, DA team. And they were very successful. That team included uh, George, I think George Bella was playing on it, Machope, the player, Patrick, Andrew Carlton played up on that team. Um, very, very talented team. I think they went pretty far in the DA um, playoffs. I think George Campbell appeared on there as a, as a very, very talented team. I feel team. like they won the, the DA that year uh, with Campbell. Andrew Carlton did. Um, the group oh, Andrew him. Carlton did. Okay. So, yeah, so in, the, in that kind of pool of players was all the initial homegrowns. You saw um, – you know, you know, you saw George Bellow, you saw Andrew Carlton, Chris Gosselin, Patrick O'Connor, and Lagos. Um, and they were all signed to different reasons. And the reason they were signed, so I think if I remember correctly, um, it was uh, Chris and Andrew who were signed first. And the reason was because there were some rules about how long you could be in a DA to qualify for homegrown status and things of the sort. And then the next three were George, Patrick, and Lagos. And they were the ones announced out of Bobby Dodd that day. Um, Interesting with all with all those five players, um, I think what what I look at is Atlanta United how much they've matured as an organization because of those five players. Those five players were at a severe disadvantage to everyone else, and Atlanta United was as well. You know, I, th I just using Lagos as an example, and I actually jotted down the dates earlier just because I want to remind myself. He played his last DA game in 2017. Went off and played in the in the U20 World Cup played four games in, I think it was London. Then he sat for almost nine months. Not wow. a single game in between there because Atlanta two did not exist at the time. So he went from, you know, he, he just trained for an entire year. So then, and that, and that, I think, you know, I look at it and I, as something I shook my head about. And I think um, I was really disappointed with the, the lack there, but he, there, what options were there? You know, he, he got loaned out for Charleston for a game, but there really wasn't much. And then Atlanta two comes in and now you get to see Atlanta United can really bring those home, those young generation kids up to the, up to the, and see them in that environment. 
yeah. and you're seeing it. You know, we see another DDY player, a former DDY player now, Caleb Wiley is doing great and, and Jackson Conway is doing great. And um, Josh Wolf's son's doing great. You know, it's sort of, so Atlanta United is really um, matured as a organization with Atlanta too. And now their youth players can get a lot of exposure. I just, you know, it's something. Um, and so Lagos obviously, you know, was training with the first team in the USL team. And um, then he moved over, you know, uh, I think it was 2019. They loaned him out to Memphis. Candidly, that was a horrible experience. Um, you know, Memphis didn't have much of an identity. It was a, it's Tim Howard's group. You know, they're, they're coming up. They're still learning. They, they played on a baseball field. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> so, um, so Lagos came back and, uh, uh bef you know, if you want to look at the timing of it and you, when Joseph went down, Lagos got loaned. So Lagos was loaned out to Phoenix, which is a great, great opportunity, but a very tough one for Lagos because that's a team that's uh, very similar to Atlanta United. They're in win now mode. Yeah. And, and, and to your point, like, you know, these players all develop at a different timeline and mm -hmm. minutes are what's so key. And so they've yeah. got to be at a club or a position where they're getting some form of minutes to get those, that experience. Um, and, and so yeah, we're talking about that lag with Lagos before Atlanta United too. Um, you know, those are, those are tough uh, on a player that, you know, particularly during a period that uh, th those are crucial months for them to be developing with experience right so yeah it's interesting yeah and i you so know how I, much I, yeah. how much say does lagos have over the loans that he's been on no does he get any say no okay. no and i mean i think um you know i think there's you know i'm going to take a ten thousand foot kind of armchair fantasy quarterback here um i think one of the things that I've been a little bit frustrated with is those of you, I know mean, a lot of people haven't seen Lagos play. Um, I don't even really, what position does he play? Good question. That's why I was going to get to it. He is a forward. He is not a midfielder. He's not a defender. He is a forward. He is a different type of forward. Um, he is not um, Adam John. He is not. Um, Thank God. You know, he's not, uh, he's not Joseph. You know, Joseph, they're all different types. That These are, you know, and this is kind of what I always say, and I said this is, can be the most critical I have been, is, is Jurgen, Klinsman, Tata Martino, and Tao Bramos all saw the same thing in Lagos, that he's well, a forward. Well, here's the thing I haven't seen. <laughs> I, I haven't yeah. seen uh, Lagos play forward. Any day of the week, I'll take him over Adam John, though. I, I'm <laughs> just not a, he is a cone on the field right now, at least the way we're using him and in the system we're in. It's just not working, and – Dave knows I'm upset about that, but yeah, I'm curious. What what do you think he would do with the minutes that Adam Johns had so far in this team, which have been completely useless in my opinion? I, I think it would be, I think what Lagos brings to the table once you sort of step back and look at um, his skill set, that if he's 25 yards uh, from goal, you know, the same fear that McGee put in people when he was running at you, Lagos puts in you. I mean, he's a scary dude, 25 yards out from goal. And the problem is, is when he's receiving the ball 65 yards from goal, it, you know, he may make the run. He may not. Um, but I think if you look at it differently, Atlanta United is very similar to the Phoenix team that he plays on now. They want to whip those balls in and let the big guy go finish it. And while you're taking you, – so you look at Adam John and you say, well, you know, Joseph Martinez does that. Well, let me, let me – you know, just my, my take on Joseph Martinez – He's probably one of the most gifted uh, finishing runners in the world. Yeah. He sees, he sees angles. He sees lines. He understands where the ball is going to be comparing him to, yeah. I mean, you saw it with Ken Juan Jones when we originally had the first, the first, you put him in, you, you think he's going to same result. No, there's a, there's a difference to what Joseph does. And it's, it's all about the runs he makes. And um, so I think when you, introducing Lagos in there I, I don't know how he would fare but I think he would present a completely unique look um and he's but you have to embrace that that that's what he is I, I will take what you've described any day of the week which is somebody who's running at somebody and trying to attack the goal which uh, I haven't seen from anybody in the substitute position of Joseph Martinez uh, I mean I'm hopeful Adam or uh, Eric Kubo Torres will be able to do some of that, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm really uh, not happy with what I'm seeing in the number nine position since Joseph is gone. I think they, 
they should have gotten more creative early on that. And I think they should have gone to the youth booth to, to make that happen. So that's just my, yeah. so, so, yes. so Mikey Dobbs and I look at Adam Jean and we say, look, you know, I mean, his movement, is non-existent like he's literally a cone until you get into the box and then maybe when he's in the box if you're pumping balls in you yeah. can go fight and battle with someone so as you as a coach coaching you know lagos right you know i i you know i said on a previous podcast that adam john to me is the representative of bad american coaching right he, he's big he's got some talent he can get in the box but it seems like nobody's ever told him to move right and he doesn't know how to take up good spaces. He doesn't know how to make runs. He's literally useless until we get into the penalty area. So for you coaching a guy like Lagos, you know, and you were talking about 25 yards from goal, but, you know, as the play is building, as he's a forward, how did you teach him, you know, to do more, to move, to to help the team? So he was gifted in that area. I mean, Lagos is very – he's very cerebral with his game. He understands – um, he understands the moment as well as anybody. Um, so Lagos would tuck in a lot, um, depending on the game. He understood when it was time to sort of pull back. But, you know, being fair to Lagos, he, he, his team that he was on his club side, his youth side, he had we had very weapons all over the field. So there were days when he could play very passive and sort of um, not really engage himself too much. And then there were days when he would go into a different place. And, um, you know, I think um, – I don't know if he's ready for the the minutes at the at, at the MLS level at this point, um, but I think you know it's tough because we won't find that out until until it happens. And I think I, I candidly I think he will be on the Ben's field soon. He just may be wearing a different jersey. You mentioned another player uh, was is George Campbell, and he's. Mm -hmm. Is he a left back or a central central back? I mean, I was yeah. I was relatively um, happy with what I saw from the minutes. Um, I think it was earlier this year he got some time on the field. Um, he certainly didn't lay an egg in terms of uh, what I saw, and and you know with uh, LGP as Dave knows on the show, who, who's a fantastic talent and athlete. Um, I was optimistic at least with what I saw, but uh, tell me if you know anything about him. So George, yeah, George is a bright young talent. Um, you know, he's a guy just like, you know, just like a lot of these young players, he just needs minutes. Um, I actually initially, to be honest with you, when um, when uh, LGP moved on, I actually thought that was a, a move part in parcel to put George Campbell in. And I think George Campbell and Miles Robinson, you know, appear to be the future of your, your center back line. Yeah. I'd love to see them in. But again, that goes back to that win, win now mentality is that, you know, Atlanta United is not going to go on a wing and a prayer. They're going to they're gonna go in and find somebody to step in, and they're going to expect George to sort of beat that player out. And that player, obviously, we found out was Meza, right? Yeah. And, um, who I, you know, who so, I personally yeah. love. I love Mesa. Yeah. He's, um, I think he brings so much experience to the team. He, we needed that Parkhurst type of presence on the field. Mm -hmm. um, and, in my opinion, I just – I've only seen a little bit of him. I mean, he's been here very long, but he just seems like a cool customer, in my opinion. Yeah, I haven't been very impressed with Mesa, to be yeah. honest. I, I feel like, you know, he's you know a little bit older, doesn't have quite the quickness, which is fine for you know a cerebral player. But I haven't been that impressed with his reading of the game. I feel like he's been, you know, I mean, an example of this is in the first MLS's back game when we turned the ball over, and he was the only guy in the center of the back. And, and he didn't have a clue that the guy um, made a run straight through the middle and they found him for basically a breakaway. And for a guy who's, you know, 29, 30 years old, whatever he is, who's played in Mexico for years, the fact that he never looked around to recognize that run, that wasn't his guy, but, you know, you got to recognize that and read it and, and, and make that play. But I think you just called it out. I think, you know, that's partially the problem of – Atlanta United being exposed is you pointed out it's not his guy and, and maybe he should have figured something out given his experience but I've seen that too much with Atlanta United where there's just not the right shape to where that shouldn't be the situation where um, we don't have have somebody covering back um, and that is one critique I have on George Bellow from what I've watched he seems threatening going forward um, but 
it, it's even, I don't know how to explain it. When I watch him and the play is developing and we don't have it, it's about a one second decision where I see him kind of flat footed and it's one second too late for him to get back. Even though he's hustling back or whatever, it's that one second delay of him reading the game from a defensive standpoint that uh, I think George Bellow has a lot of room to grow. And I'm going to add something to that and throw it back to Jeff, which is, so Atlanta United too has, has had Bellow, they've had Campbell, they've had Goslin. You know, these are, you know, youth national team players. They are homegrown players. These are supposed to be the future. Um, they seem to me, you know, quite good on the ball, quite good going forward. And yet, and I haven't watched Atlanta United 2 play very much, but they just give up goals after goals after goals. Their record is pretty awful. And so my question is, you know, why can't those guys read the game? Why can't they defend? Well, so context is key here, right? Um, if you look across the USL with the MLS sides, um, so it's low dose, you know, obviously LA Galaxy 2 and some of the other ones, what the MLS sides are doing is you, you'll find usually the MLS sides at the bottom of the tables. And, the, and they're all doing the same thing as they're trotting out. So you're trotting out academy kids versus in what in some cases are seasoned professionals. You know, there's the USL, for example, Romario Williams is a great player. You know, we all familiar with him, but Romario's in the USL. So can you imagine a, you know, a 16 year old kid like George Bello making a first appearance in the sense, George probably a bad example because he's been playing first team minutes, but think about these young kids coming into that USL environment and their first exposure is going up against Romario Williams, who's played in world cup qualifying games, who's played in the MLS, you know, I mean, these are, there are, you know, 28-year-old guys with, you know, 100, 200 appearances in the MLS running up against these, what are basically high school kids, right? So, you know, I think that's what the MLS sides are doing. Now that, so they're, they're really treating it as a developmental um, environment as opposed doesn't to... Doesn't that say you know, that the, if those guys can't stop a Romario Williams or whatever, that they're nowhere close to stepping into the full side? It, it, you know, so the analogy I would use is, is that... It, you know, if you make your decision on, let's say you, we all go out to, you know, Truist Field and we get into the batting cage and, you know, the three of us go three for 10 hitting 90 mile an hour fastballs. So that means we're ready to get one on the, on the mound? No, right? I mean, it's sort of, a, it, you know, it, it takes a lot of time for those kids to develop. And, and I think Mikey touched on it earlier. It's like just, you know, we're talking about Meza and his and, and this kind of backline movement. It's yeah. think about these young kids trying to learn the game beyond going up against people who've been doing it for a decade at the professional level. Yeah. And, you know, it, that's the kind of thing where, you know, you have to get the minutes. There's no, there's no training for that. There's no standing in the batting cage swinging at them, right? You're going to have to get out there when the crowd is yelling and when people are, are moving and you're playing against guys um, who know what they're doing. All right. Thanks for listening. If anybody actually made it this far in the podcast, would love to hear your feedback on Twitter at ATL on fire and tell your friends to subscribe. We are on iTunes, Google play, and really any sort of podcast uh, platform that you're